Um, thank you so much for inviting me to be on this uh, panel. I have to say this is the first time for me to be able to see people in two other countries at the same time. Uh, quite exciting. I have to make sure I don't get distracted wondering about Nairobi and London and concentrating on the topic. Uh, I think that uh, just to give a little bit of context to the issues of, of delivering uh, quality education, about 10 years ago when we sort of really started working at the national level, um, much of India was still concerned with uh, providing access and ensuring provision to elementary education. And uh, for us, I think we had already seen that enrollment levels were high and that we really need to start thinking about what shall we do about kids who are in school. Um, can you hear me clearly? Very clearly, very clearly. Okay, yeah. Um, since Marta was trying to leave the room, I thought I should ask that. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think the, one of the problems that, one of the challenges that we face was really how to get this issue of outcomes and of quality to the center of the debate and kind of, um, you know, uh, not push back um, issues of access, but uh, kind of convince people that provision and access were things that had already happened and that we really need to think about the next step, which is, you know, what are the children learning in school? So for us, uh, I think we've used a kind of a multi-pronged approach you collected evidence, and you collected evidence at kind of all levels. And we started at the district level, which is where really the plans for education are made. And then you would aggregate that up to the state level. And so then you would have a national picture, because it looked like at all levels, you need to kind of get the message across that now we have a new challenge, and the challenge is how do you deliver quality, as opposed to how do you deliver quantity. And on the quantity side, I think people have worked out you know, if you put money down, you build buildings, you um, recruit teachers, you buy textbooks, and you can get to a certain point. But the issue in quality is you have to really rethink all of this. So it's not just money that delivers you the quality. You have to fundamentally change some of the priorities and operating practices within the education system to get to quality. So, you know, even before talking about politics or power, and I, I'm, you know, I'm sure that means different things to different people, big challenge was whose priority is it to deliver outcome? And over the last 10 years in India, we've seen a shift, but it's been, um, you know, at some level a slower shift than you'd like, but a faster shift than you'd expect in moving this issue of outcomes to the center of the stage, and then worrying about how are these outcomes going to be delivered? <laughs> So number one for us was, do you think it's a problem? And often if you don't think it's a problem, you're not going to deliver it. Uh, so if it's a problem, then you need to think of solutions. Are there solutions available? Can these solutions be done on scale? And I think within Prasam, therefore, we have different arms. Uh, the side that I'm involved with, which is ASAR, the production of the evidence, we do it relentlessly at all levels every year. And on the side of providing the solutions, is the Pratham side, where we are constantly evolving and experimenting with a variety of solutions at the same time. So what do you do if you're working with village communities is one kind of a model. What do you do if you're working with government at the local level, like at a district level with a thousand schools, is another kind of model. What do you do when you want to work with a whole state is another kind of strategy. And we find that you have to be constantly on your toes trying to develop what works, demonstrating what works, and also collecting evidence as you go, and I think being very upfront and open about failures and successes. Over the years, I think we've learned that, you know, like in a soccer or a football game, you mark, everybody marks somebody else on the other team. And you kind of need to do that. Maybe it's because India is a large country, maybe because things are centralized and decentralized in different ways. That there are, you have to stay constantly in touch with uh, you know, all sorts of different levels and constantly move with what you've learned. So I'm not sure this is directly answering your question, uh, but I think that um, it's, it's, uh, people learn quite quickly. So as soon as you've overcome 
one set of challenges, you know, you're naturally faced with another set. But the longer you work close to people, even if you don't work with them, so I'm talking particularly of the government, and if there's a, some amount of trust that is developed to say that these guys are always going to be players in this game and they're always going to be constantly coming up with things, I think a kind of uh, respect grows on both sides, that there are possibilities that, you know, can be tried. And I guess change doesn't happen in, always in a linear fashion. But we find as soon as we've experimented with something good in one part of the country, some other part of the country is kind of ready to accept that solution that this part of the country was not yet ready for. And being somewhat large and being in many different contexts, I think it helps because as soon as you get frustrated in state one, you see a lot of opportunity in state two. Um, so this is a dynamic game. I think you have to kind of enjoy playing it. Uh, and uh, deal with the issues of how do you get things done in different contexts, I think, in different ways. Thanks, Rukmi. That, that was great. Could, could I, I mean, may, maybe the most obvious question to ask you is that, you know, on the basis of the monitoring work that you've done in um, ASA or the delivery work in Pratam, what, what's an example of, you know, let's say a state that has gone from one level to a higher level in terms of learning achievement or a scale example and what have been the ingredients of of the success uh, i'll give you a, a recent example from my own home state which is bihar shanta knows it uh, well i think it's one of the most educationally backward areas in india um, where uh, over the last five or six years the, a lot of progress has happened on enrollment and for part of that way we have worked with the government at sort of from the local level all the way to the state level to partner with them to get it done. So on the one hand there was some amount of team built and trust built that these guys help in implementation and as soon as they kind of got over the enrollment barrier there was concern in the state about school attendance. Uh, attendance levels for children were not as high even though entitlements were being given to them. And uh, there was a lot of discussion on attendance. And one day I got a phone call from one of the district administrators. So a district in India can have anywhere between 1,000 to 3,000 schools. And he called me to say that he's finding that they've reached kind of a barrier to attendance. I mean, attendance has gone up to about 70%. It's not going up higher. And he's wondering about what to do because they've tried all administrative and other ways to do it. So we discussed possible strategies using the evidence that we had collected from the state as well as from the district. And one of the issues that we discussed was the fact that, you know, uh, in any grade in India, children are well below grade level. And not only are they well below grade level, but the uh, tail of the distribution is quite long, which means that if you're a fifth grade teacher, you're usually teaching from a fifth grade textbook, but you probably have kids in front of you, only 10% of whom can actually comprehend what you're doing. And so would there be a way in which you could deal with this diversity in children's learning levels? And what we suggested was, would it be possible to group children not by grade, but by level? And I said, we'd be happy to come and sort of discuss it with you in person and you know, go to your school. So by the time I showed up there a couple of days later, he had actually done his own assessment to kind of test out the hypothesis that I put in front of him and come to the same conclusion that in fifth grade, almost 60% of kids were not even at second grade level. And therefore teaching from the fifth grade textbook wasn't working. And so, you know, we worked with the team in the district really to work at this, you know, teaching by level kind of idea. We did, uh, uh, you know, it starts with a simple assessment, which is very much like the other assessment, but there was a willingness to recognize the problem and already a desire to look for a solution. And we were able to fill the gap. And having done this in a couple of districts last year with the district administration, with districts who actually wanted a change, before the planning for the next year began, these districts could speak on behalf of this model to the state government. And this school year, the state government has scaled it up to the whole state. Now, a different set of issues are standing right now in front of us in terms of implementation. But we could see that a simple basic model with easy ingredients, not much extra resources required, which was able to energize the system, 
was able to be scaled up by people who are pushing for it who are not us. Um, I don't know if this is a, a good example. We have to see how this year goes. But it certainly is something that gives us a lot of hope. The demonstration, evidence, prioritization, energizing teams can go a long way in really turning around the practices yeah. that can lead to better delivery. Actually, it's a, it's a fantastic example, and I think an illustration of how a significant reform within this system of education administration can you know, deliver real real change at a classroom level. Um, 